honor to be among you. I'm humbled to share my words, my observations, my simple truths, and the musings of my soul. As a neurosurgeon, I have seen the insides of many, many brains. Don't worry, I will spare you the gory details. Nevertheless, every time I cut away the skull, I peel back the outer lining of the brain. I pause for a few moments in awe. I'm in awe of the deceptively simple elegance of the anatomy. I am in awe of the intricate, complicated networks therein. There is mystery in those undulations. There are secrets in those crevices. There is a link to the infinite and the unknown. Our thoughts are powerful. The human mind is powerful. Our words belie our soul. Our thoughts beget our actions. Our actions beget our character. Our character determines our legacy. That is, who will remember us? And how will they remember us? Our thoughts do not exist at random. They exist part of a system, like the planets in the galaxy. We all inhabit fears, assumptions, prejudices. Consider that what we call the barbed wire outer fencing of your mind. Inside is the pasture upon which our emotions and our ideas flourish, upon which our minds ruminate and graze. The outer barbed wire perimetry and the inner pasture form what we call your mindset. There's a Stanford psychologist that coined the term mindset. Mindset is the way we filter the world. Most of us are not even aware that we have a mindset. Most of us have a mindset foisted upon us by destiny's whim. Whether you're born in Paris or Papua New Guinea, whether you're a Rastafarian or a Rockefeller, you will have a set of ideas passed on to you. They will be particular to your particular cultural and social milieu. Dr. Dreck showed that the mindset determines our reactions and our results in life. They determine our failure and our success. She, did, she coined the term and defined a fixed mindset and a flexible mindset. For example, same life, identical life incidences will produce very different results in different people. A divorce or your spouse having an affair. In one mindset, it will trigger a downward spinning cycle of self-deprecation and destruction and doubt. I'm a failure. I'm unlovable. What did I do? I'm not enough. I'm not deserving. In a different mindset, you will say to yourself, how can I sow seeds now that will harvest a different result in the future? You acknowledge it was a bad situation, but how are you going to get a different result next time? The mindset determines what we dare to do, where we dare to go, who we dare to love. Mindsets are vitally important. <coughs> Yet most of us happily ruminate with our, within our own little barbed wire fencing, grazing on our little pastures, never realizing that there are other pastures beyond. Let me give you an example of two mindsets that I have coined, indigenous and indigenous. <laughs> the indigenous mindset is a mindset called the inheritance mindset. It's based upon entitlement. It's based upon certain intrinsic factors over which you have no control you didn't work for, and frankly, you can't do much about. Your skin color, your gender, your last name, your religion, your relationship to some famous politician or family member or pop star or whatever. This mindset allows you to benefit from things that you yourself have not created. Your mind didn't envision it, your spirit didn't want it, and your hands haven't built it. These things come to you, they fall into your lap, you inherit them. Or in the extreme case, you just go out and grab them. In this mindset is inherently destructive. It is a mindset that takes. It takes and spends, it takes and uses. 
The hallmark of the indig indigenous mindset is that you always have less than when you started. Because it is a taking mindset, manifest in this existence is jealousy, an idleness, a certain impatience for the destruction of other people's dreams. Because it is a scarcity mindset, you can only benefit if I am destroyed. Your dreams only exist at the expense of another's. Let me give you an example. When I worked in the United States, I had a very intelligent, wonderful patient who had amassed over the years a vintage, handcrafted, beautiful gun collection. It comprised guns that had been used in the last battles of the 19th and 20th century. Exquisite, and it was his pride. He cherished his collection. He became ill and left his affairs in the estate of his daughter. As his health deteriorated, his daughter insisted that we stop taking care of him. And then she melted down his gun collection into silver blocks that she was going to take to the bank and cash in. I have no doubt that she would have spent the money, except that the patient made a complete and full recovery. Needless to say, he was devastated, heartbroken. Needless to say, he took his daughter off his estate. <laughs> At a global level, the entitlement mindset is responsible for many of the ills of humanity. The indigenous mindset presumes that one group is the chosen one. We're entitled, you're not. So I can rape, pillage, destroy, take, murder, plunder on behalf of the entitled group. Slavery. Terrorism, genocide, sexism, discrimination of any kind takes its seeds in the entitlement mindset. When I was an undergraduate, I took a trip to Warsaw, Poland. I had a backpack and a huge curiosity for the group that was called the Eastern Bloc at that time. It was a heady time for Poland. There was Solidarność and Lech Walesa. I had a fantastic visit. But I do remember getting off of the bus in one Warsaw neighborhood. And I, was, and I looked up. The buildings were immense, imposing. I got out and wandered into a maze of building after building, row after row of gray blocks, granite pieces. It struck me later, and I reflected later, that it was my very first encounter with the architecture of oppression. Whole avenues, streets, buildings had been constructed to make the human feel insignificant, powerless, and small. I could feel those buildings pressing on me, taking away my vibrancy. The environment reflected the author authoritarian mindset of the leaders. It was meant to make the people feel small. They were dreary and drab, it's true, but they were also sinister, menacing, reminding me that behind them was a monolithic bastion of power that could crush me at any time. Now let's take it a little closer to home. Let's look at our city, our fair city, our country. What does our environment say about us? What is the environment telling the world about our mindset as a people? It doesn't take much to see the crumpled hopes, the shattered ambitions, the crushed dreams in bottles, cans, shreds of paper, all the trash that's piled up high on the sidewalks, the streets. It spills onto the sidewalks, churches, schools, lawns. Look at our street lights, rusted, mangled, torn, resigned. The sidewalks crumble beneath us. The roads are perilous with their gaping cracks and their open craters. We have created a landscape of helplessness and resignation. Are you shocked when you see trash on the street? Do you shriek when you see a, a, a pothole? It doesn't shock you anymore. It doesn't outrage you anymore. What ceases to outrage us, we have accepted. What we have accepted is normal. What is normal is the new standard.
think about your environment, your office, your cubicle, your home, your factory, your business. What does that environment tell us about you and your mindset? What have we as a nation unwittingly embraced in our indifference or in our scurrying to make ends meet? What outrageous realities have we embraced and made normal, made standard? Think about it. I want to tell you a little bit about a completely different mindset, the indigenous mindset. This mindset is not so concerned with your intrinsic factors, entitlements per se. It values responsibility over entitlement. So it's more what you do with those intrinsic factors. So let's say you are born a Rastafarian, like Bob Marley. You create an authentic sound from your homeland that brings joy to millions, no, probably billions of people. People play it decades after you're dead. These are billionaires, bohemians, business people alike. If you're born a Rockefeller, you take that personal wealth and you multiply it. You multiply it to create one of the largest global philanthropic networks the world has ever known. You support institutions, you build schools, you support cancer research. The indigenous mindset is about what you give back, what you bring to the table, what value you add. The indigenous mindset, the indigenous mindset by definition, is multiplicative. There's always more than when you started. Because you're envisioning, you're creating, you're building. It's a giving mindset. Because it's giving, intrinsic in its manifestation, is a tolerance, a celebration of diversity and competition. If an indigenous, indigenous mindset person sees somebody with a faster car, a bigger house, a better business, better idea, a nicer app, they'll want it, of course. They're human, they have envy. But will they try to sabotage that? Will they try to bring it down? Will they try to take it as their own? No. Indigenous will be determined to build something better bigger, faster, shinier. It is the mindset of success. It is the mindset of a vibrant, competitive community. Imagine all those points of excellence trying to outdo each other. By contrast, an indigenous mentality of entitlement is the mindset of mediocrity. Let me give you one of my favorite things about the indigenous mindset. It is a mindset that thinks into the future, not just for now, but ahead. I'm inspired by the Native American tribe called the Iroquois. In the original documents of the Iroquois Confederation, the wisdom of the elders passed. They talk about the seventh generation, that the decisions you make are not for you now, today, not for tomorrow, your kids, not for your children's children, but for the seventh generation. Think about that, it's deep. The Iroquois document says, in all your deliberations, in all of your efforts at lawmaking, in all of your official acts, let self-interest be cast into oblivion. Look and listen to the welfare of the whole people. And it goes on to say, not just the present generation, but those whose faces yet lie beneath the Earth's surface. The unborn of the future nation. The unborn of the future generation. Imagine how our resources would be allocated. Imagine the economic, political, social, religious decisions we'd make if we were thinking not of ourselves, not of my little foo-foo, my little baby, my kid, my future generation, my grandkid, no. Self-doubt, self-interest into oblivion. It is the unborn of the future nation. I'm gonna give you an example. You may think it's absurd, 
but I think it's very telling of the contrast of the indigenous and indigenous mindset. Let's go back, 1997, Steve Jobs kicked out of Apple, went off to Pixar, made a lot of money, came back to Apple. Apple's on its knees. Its fortunes are in the doldrums. By contrast, Microsoft's fortunes are ascendant. The PC's dominant, they have the market share. Steve Jobs goes to Apple and he makes a phone call. Who does he make the phone call to? He makes a phone call to what you would think would be his competitor. He makes a phone call and he says to the head of Microsoft, I need your help. Yeah. He says, I gotta turn this thing around, meaning Apple, but I need your help. They talk for an hour. And at the end of it, Steve Jobs says, thank you. Thank you for your support. The world will be better for it. How many of you do not have an i something, an iPod, an iPad, or all the tablets and things that have been spawned from that technology? Who here has not been touched by that genius? Not only of Apple, but also of Microsoft. But there was a moment in time where it could have been completely different. If Steve Jobs and his Microsoft counterpart had embraced an indigenous mindset, they would have spent years in patent battles, which were raging at the time. They would have sent spies into each other's companies. They would have pulled each other down. They would have tried to destroy each other, spent thousands and th billions. Oh, these are, these are not our kind, these are not thousand dollar people. Millions and billions of dollars trying to bring each other down, but they didn't. And Jobs was right. The world better for it. Look at what you have. Look what you're holding. Look at how you're seeing me wherever you are. It is from that moment of leadership where two people, one could have pulled the trigger and said, no, I'm not going to help you. Watch them fall. But no, they came from an indigenous mindset of abundance, of competition, and of embracing diversity. Because aside from the fact that those two were born in 19... Can't be 75. They're born in the same year and both dropped out of Harvard. They had nothing in common. They were like chalk and cheese. But they worked together. And because of that moment, we have the technology that we have today. I don't think as a country, as a nation, we can get to where we aspire to be unless we embrace an indigenous mindset. A mindset of adding value, of bringing things to the table, of giving back. I'm not talking about E equals M squared, uh, Einstein kind of genius. There's genius right here in this room, in this city, and in every corner of this country. You've seen it. There is genius here. Let us recognize and foster each other's genius. Every time we do something that adds value to somebody else, we're expressing our genius. There is genius in a brilliant Indian tech innovator. There is genius in an old white farmer. There is genius in a young black entrepreneur. There's genius in a mother, in a teacher, an entrepreneur. Ministers of parliament, lawyers. There is genius everywhere. I am making a call to action. Not a call to arms, don't get me in any trouble. Not a call to arms. It's a call to genius. I challenge each and every one of you in this room each and every one of us that yearns for a better Zimbabwe, a better world, to perform consistent, daily, or random acts of genius. Every time you speak truth to power, every time you deny a bribe, every time you organize a neighborhood cleanup, every time you volunteer to help orphans, abused, rape victims, every time you plant a tree, clean up your garden, every time you save a rhino, Every time you create something new, a song, a poem. Every time you organize a music festival. Every time you offer spiritual guidance to those in need. Every time you genuinely make a friend outside of your race, outside of your comfort zone, outside of your religion. Every time you open a coffee shop, make a new app, build a business. 
you are expressing your genius. You are altering our legacy as a generation and as a people. I, for one, am not waiting for any superhero in a red cape. The time is now. I'm not waiting for anything to die. I'm not waiting for anything to start. I'm not waiting for anything new, anything old, nothing. I'm getting on with it. You can be sure I will be expressing my genius. If you want to find me, that's where I'll be. And I challenge you to do the same. Change your mindset, change our destiny. Change our collective mindset as a country, we change our collective destiny. From, from a neurosurgical point of view, the best part of that, you can change your mindset, no scalpel required. Thank you very much. <laughs>